like I said, this is a um a extremely um, in depth teaching. So we just kind of touching on the beginning of it. We got a video that we did um, that we recorded last Shabbat, but we was in the middle of it. So I just kind of want to get everybody up like up to speed before I try to post that video, right? So if you got it, you're looking at it. Um, so what is the gospel? And would you just click through the next slide? We're gonna start talking about it. So it says, "What is the gospel?" Now, traditionally in your mainstream churches, this is what you hear: the gospel is the good news that God became a man in Jesus Christ. He lived, and that the life we should have lived, and died the death that we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the he rose from the dead, proving that he's the Son of God, and offering the gift of salvation for all those who repent and believe the gospel. Now, that's a big, long definition, um, but it's not entirely true. OK, um, there's truth in it, but basically just giving the surface of what the gospel really is. Um, there's some misconceptions about the totality of what the gospel is supposed to do. Um, for instance, when it says uh, the gospel is the good news that God became a man, Jesus Christ, and he lived that life should should have lived and all these other things they're talking about. Um, for all who repent and believe the gospel, that is true. But there's an order of how the things are supposed to go. And that's what we're about to get into. All right. So you go to the next slide. The gospel has three main functions. Um, number one, Jesus removed the penalty of sin. In, the in theological terms, they call that justification. Uh, number two, Jesus removes the separation caused by sin. They call that re reconciliation. And number three, Jesus removes the power of sin. They call that sanctification. All these things also are partly true. <laughs> um, in most churches, the way they teach it is that Christ died on the cross, so now we're all free from sin. Um, that's not true. I mean, if we look, there's a guy named Joseph Prince. Um, he has videos all over, all over. I mean, a lot of people follow him in Christian circles. He has this doctrine called hyper grace. And hyper grace supposed to mean because Christ died for your sin, sin doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it's, it's went all the way to the left. So we know that sin um, still exists. And the penalty for sin definitely exists. It was never done away with. The penalty for sin is still, still intact. Um, what he did was he allowed us a way to be redeemed through him that we wouldn't be able to um, incur that penalty when we walk in this truth. So what we're trying to do right now, again, is try to completely understand how we walk in that truth. Um, the, number two, when it says Jesus removes the separation caused by sin, also partly true. Yes, if you're walking in the truth. If you're not walking in the truth, he has removed the separation <laughs> that sin causes. We know when we when we sin, we turn away from the most high, right? I mean, it's just common, it's common sense. So um, that barrier that separates us is something of our own doing. It's, and it's nothing that um, that has been like magically removed since Christ rose from the dead. Um, number three, it says Jesus removed the power of sin by um, sanctification. Um, again, half true. Yes, when you're walking in the spirit, you're walking in the Ruach. The Ruach leads and guides you in all truth. So if he's leading and guiding you in all truth, you're not walking in sin, then the sin doesn't have, a, have the authority over you. So when you're born again, the, the thought is that you have a, um, your mind has been reborn and your heart has been circumcised. To the fact that that sin doesn't have the dominion over you, but at the same time, again, if we walk in sin, we're going to receive the the penalty and the separation that sin brings. Everybody, everybody, kind of got me. All right, let's keep moving. All right. So you, you see the slide that says false facts. I'm going to get into that. We're going to start um, opening it up. So next slide says the true gospel. Um, what is it really about? So that's what we're going to talk about. Because if we know what Christ did, we know what the Mashiach did, right? We know what Yahushua did for us. We know that um, our hearts were evil. And I, going even back to our ancestors, even in the scriptures we read in Deuteronomy, um, the scriptures from the jump street was telling us to circumcise not only our body, but our hearts. You know what I, our ancestors had stick neck, stick neck and, you know, hard hearts. And because of that, the penalty fell upon them. And then yada, yada, we end up in captivity in the whole nine. But. There's an actual application. With the Hebrew, there's always something that's um, uh, direct or concrete that goes along with the spiritual. So in the Hebrew mind, not in the Greek mind, <laughs> but in the Hebrew mind, 
there is a physical and a spiritual salvation. Everybody get, everybody get what I'm talking about? Physical and spiritual salvation. So the gospel or the good news is about that physical and spiritual salvation, not just a spiritual salvation. Let's keep going. All right. Truth is a new hate speech. <laughs> very, 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 very true statement. Um, and it says, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So the things that we're going to discuss today on the surface sound harsh, but they're not. I mean, uh, everything that is written in the scripture is written for a reason. And we know that Bible says that he's not, the scripture tells us that um, the most high is not the author of confusion. So everything has to be done in order, right? And so it's not that um, people, you know, let me get to that. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Let's just get into this. All right. We talked about this last time in, um, in the um, ownership by but the top 10 alternative facts concerning the faith, right? All right. We all know that <laughs> the letter J didn't exist until um, about 500 years ago, right? So now again, what but what I'm saying is I'm not we not amongst those people that's gonna go battle people over names and all that kind of stuff. That's not what we're doing. We're getting a proper understanding. Right? Alright, so um the net letter J is only five hundred years old. They did, were they were not calling the Mashiach Christ, nor were they calling him Jesus. Right? Um and we know again what the Hebrew names are, um, and that's variation of the Hebrew names. People, um, modern Hebrew, they use the modern Hebrew. Some people use the um, Paleo or the original Hebrew. But saying that to say, um, we, we know his name ain't Jesus. I'm just gonna keep going. Jesus was not a Jew, right? <laughs> the Jews didn't exist. I mean, the, the term, the terminology Jew didn't exist to the 1600s. So no, Jesus was not a Jew. Somebody asked me that this week. He said, "Was well, Jesus a Jew?" I'm like, no, he was not. He was a he was of a, he was a Yahudim. He was of the tribe of Yehuda. Okay. Um, another fact that we say, Jesus did not replace Israel with the church. There are some doctrines out there. They believe that it's a gospel to the church, and then there's a gospel to the to the Jews, whatever whoever they are. Right. <laughs> no such thing. Right. <laughs> Starting from the beginning, if you go back in the scriptures, if we go to um uh, to the Pentateuch, we're gonna see that in the actual scripture it was written that there's supposed to be one law. For the stranger and for the bloodline. Okay? There's not two different laws. I mean, I don't know where they even got that from. I mean, you can go back to some people believe there's a law of God and there's a law of Christ. Absolute nonsense. Uh, <laughs> there's one way, all right? So Christ did not replace Israel with the church. All right? Number five, the church was never called the church. What? So We've been conditioned to think these things. We've been in it for a hot minute, but um, but no, it was never called a church. I'm going to dig into what it was originally called, and that's the reason why you don't see like see that term really used in um in, you know in the first half of the book. But you hear all the other terms we use: congregation, assembly. You hear all those terms. You don't hear, hear, the, hear the term church. We'll get into that term later on. Um, Jesus is not part of a, a trinity, or Yahushua is not part of a trinity. Right. Trinity don't exist. Um, the Trinity is a pagan concept. The tr Trinity is a um, not only is it a pagan concept, it is an ancient concept. Predating the birth of the Mashiach. OK, um, the Trinity came up um, post flood, started with Nimrod, his wife, Samaramis and his son, Tammuz. OK, so um, the Hebrews. Matter of fact, we can get into the, sh the uh, Shema. Um, Shema Israel, um, uh, Yahuwah Eloheinu, Yahuwah Akkad. Here, Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord in English, right? So, the first thing a Hebrew learns from day one is that the Most High is one. Okay, that's the reason why even Mashiach, every time he asks, kill talking about how him and his father are one, right? Get into that later on, but saying that to say so. Um, the concept of three gods is always a pagan um, concept, okay? And, you, and you're going to have arguments with people or you're going to have discussions with people, which a lot of times turn into arguments. 
and they're gonna say stuff like um well you know three guys you know it's not really three guys but they all won but if you look up the doctrine of trinity the definition of trinity is that there are three separate people okay and the first thing i ask people i like okay so let's say let, i'm gonna um give you that so let's you know let's go through that so if, if uh the father name is yahuwah or people say the lord in christianity and the son name is yahushua or jesus and who the holy ghost name what's his name why is he left out <laughs> where is he at when they doing stuff <laughs> like again how can he be a separate thing and then when the scripture to tell us from from the beginning and the end that it's one one spirit one one um lord one faith you know one master, one faith, one baptism. All that stuff. But anyway, we're getting to that later on in this teaching. Jesus did not found, found Christianity. Constantine did. All right? Now, there's a difference between, and people say, well, the word Christian is in the Bible. It is, right? But it's different between the Christians and Christianity. Right? Um, uh, Brother Yosh uh, you know, Yoshiahu got a good teaching on that. Online, he's talking about how um, the word Mashiach, which you know, you know, translate as Christians. Basically, the concept was it was what it's, it, it in essence is what we call messianics today. Do everybody get what I'm saying? Need, it might need me to explain yeah. explain a messianic. No sir. Okay, so you're right. So you got the Hebrews, huh? Okay, so um Okay, all right. All right, shalom, bro. So um basically it's like this. When you when you look in Christendom, you got the church and then people tell you you have the Jew or the Jewish people, right? So you have two different segments of the Jewish people. You got the people who claim they are non-messianic, in other words, the ones who believe in the Messiah, and you got the other ones who don't believe in the Messiah. Did everybody catch that? So the ones who believe in the Messiah are called messianics, or they believe in the Messiah. So the, the reason why they would use the term Mashiach, or um, you know, in Greek, um, the anointed ones, the Christianos, or which you know being Christians. Is because they're talking about these Hebrews who believed in the Messiah. Everybody got me on that? So we look at on the back end, we look at Christian as being like a whole other religion that was started started by Christ. That Christ came and started his new religion. He he did not. And the term Christian wouldn't even apply that way. The the, the way they applied Christian was or um Christiano um uh, Christos, whatever way you want to um, pronounce it. They were talking about the, the Hebrews who believed in the Messiah versus the Hebrews who did not believe in the Messiah. They already got me? Okay, all right. So, Constantine founded Christianity, right? And I know people argue me, argue me on that point. I'm going to give you Constantine's creed, and you're going to understand why he founded Christianity um, <laughs> later on in his teaching. All right. Jesus did not remove the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is live and well. The Bible says when sin is finished, it brings forth what? Death, right? We still dying, right? Okay. <laughs> and people, if, if they live in, in sin, they will incur the second death. So he didn't do away with it. All these are all like misnomers when you talk about Christianity, right? Jesus did not die for the whole world. Okay. This is the other thing that's, I'm explaining. Okay. So they're like, no, it had to be, what are you talking about? Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to explain. I'm going to give you what the scriptures actually say about why and how he died and the bible says that he died according to the scriptures now i'm gonna preface that before i even get to that point when, when, I, when I say that jesus christ did not die for the uh mashiach didn't die for the whole world what i'm telling you is that it ain't that he didn't bring salvation to the world you understand what i'm saying that's not what i'm saying i'm not saying that he didn't bring salvation to the entire world what he did was he died for a certain group of people. So the salvation would be for the entire world. Do everybody get what I'm saying? 
Everybody there? Okay, so I'm I'm gonna explain it. I'm a, a little bit deeper, but and I'm, I'm gonna give you a little bit right now. So this is the reason why the scripture says stuff like it says that um, that Christ died for those who um, for the circumcision are the ones who are under the circumcision, right? Now, and the ones who are under the, the you know not ones under circumcision, but one that are under the laws, the people of the circumcision. Okay, so. Who are given the laws according to scripture? The Israelites, right? Who were the circumcision in scripture? The Israelites, right? Okay. So when the scripture says that he came and he died for them, it's a reason. And if you look at all the prophecies, you're going to start to understand this now. Um, Mo, Mo do a great teaching on this and, and he, he explains what a kingdom is. So for instance, you have a business. You want eventually you want customers to come to your business, right? I know Ty, you know all about business. You you the business man, right? <laughs> so when you make when you great establish your business, do you go get customers or do you have a staff first? Get your customers. Before you get a staff? Well, it depends. A lot of times you want the customers being paid for the staff. Right, right, but I'm saying, but you got to have actually a structure of that business you do. You bottle to, yes, first, you right? You have, to, you have to build a structure, even if it's by yourself, you got to build a structure. Right, right, because they, there has to be somewhere to, where they can come in, unless it's a mobile business, but let's say if it's a um, brick and mortar business, right. you know, you got to have somewhere right. to, to retail, you got to have... Yeah, with a, brick and, with, a, with a brick and mortar, you do have to have a staff and a system in place, yes, sir. Right, so it works the same way with a kingdom. So in order for you to have a kingdom, you got to first have um rulers you got to have um a location you got to have a um you got to have laws you got to have all these things to be able to build up a kingdom if you have a kingdom and this we we'll get to that too about the law but if you have a kingdom without no laws without without any rulers what do you have you have anarchy right so in order for you to establish a kingdom you got to have the people in place who are going to rule the kingdom so this is the reason why when the scripture says those things about Christ dying for the house of Israel, and I'm, I'm going to give you, you know, we get into those scriptures, I'm going to show you that later on in this teaching. It literally says he died for the house of Israel. But the reason why he died for the house of Israel, because the house of Israel are the, the basically they're the backbone of the kingdom. So the, in order for the kingdom to be established, Israel has to be established first. Everybody got that? Yeah. So this is why, why Paul says, to the what? To the Yahudim first. And then the Greek. In other words, to the Jew first. And then the Greek. He says what? Blessing and cursing. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what we read all the scriptures. That's what he says. Blessing and cursing first to what? To the, to the Jew first and to, to the Greek. Because it is the um it's the Yahudim and the Northern Kingdom or Israel, Israel or the whole house of Israel. Who sets up the kingdom and allows the nations to be able to come in and receive um, salvation in, in, in a certain the ones who, who decide to, because not everyone will. But so this is the purpose of Israel. And that's what, you know, you talk about the difference between um, following the scriptures according to the way they're written and following the scriptures the way people want to present them when they got a they got an agenda. But there are people out there who um when they, they go around yelling, screaming at people and telling every Gentile that they're going to be they they going to be they um, sex slave and all kind of nonsense like that. Because they don't understand scriptures because <laughs> the purpose of Israel is to be a light for the Gentiles. And the Bible says that the law will flow forth from Jerusalem in that time period and that the Gentiles will flow into the kingdom. And there'll be certain ones that will um, there are certain strangers, according to scripture, that would join themselves with the house of Israel. But Israel has to be in righteous standing first. Israel has to be in the land first. Israel has to be redeemed first. It is Israel who are Israel who are in violation of the scriptures. Right? Remember, the covenant is was with the house of Israel. Everybody got me? Yes. So this is the reason why Israel needed a savior. Israel needs a savior right now. <laughs> Y'all saw that this week, Flando Castile. Um, all the stuff that's going down, all this tribulation and anguish that we we have as people, we still we still needed the we, we, which we have our deliverer, but we have to walk in a way that the deliverer can fulfill the things that um, he has put in place for us, our our inheritance, 
and our heritage. So, and this is nothing new. The Israelites basically been in some type of oppression um, since, the, since right after the time of David. And this ties directly back to the gospel. So what is the gospel about? When we read the gospel, when we actually read the, the chapter that talks about the gospel, you'll see why it's written the way it's written. Okay? All right, so Jesus is not taking people to heaven. Okay? The concept that we've learned in church um, over the years is that, you know, you hear songs like I Fly Away, you know, you believe we're going to sprout wings and we're going to fly up to heaven and we're going to be with the Lord forevermore, right? <laughs> you know, um, in general, we've been taught that, you know, we got it real hard down here, but when we die, we're going to go up to heaven, we'll see the streets of gold, we'll see little um, little uh, fat angels with, um, with harps flying around in the air, little baby fat angels and stuff like that. All that stuff is from Greek, from Greek thought. That is not what's about to happen. The concept in scripture is our father, which art in heaven, thy kingdom what? Come. Thy will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. Okay? So in the Hebrews, the Hebrews understood that there's a future kingdom that's coming to earth, not us going up to heaven. Okay, the concept of us going up to heaven and, and being in the cosmos, all this stuff again, it comes from Greek thought. That's the Greeks, um, the Epicureans and the, the um, Stoics and all them. They believed that the body was a um, was a prison, and they'd be away from the body and roam the cosmos, the highest existence. So this is the reason why when you read when Paul, when Paul goes to Mars Hill in the Book of Acts, he started preaching to them resurrection, and they thought he was a fool. Like, because then the mindset, why would you want to be trapped inside of a body? That was the mindset. They're like, no, no, you need to roam the, cap, the, the, the cosmos and be with the gods of Olympus and that, that nonsense. So, but that Greek thought had trickled into the church. And so that's the reason why people think that, man, you can go to heaven and walk the streets of gold. And the Bible says the streets of gold are coming down out of heaven to earth. Right? John didn't see the new Jerusalem in heaven. He saw new Jerusalem come down out of heaven. So this is the concept, but these are all misconceptions. Where we at at time? Let's see, 43? Okay, we're getting to a couple of slides. <laughs> um, so you, I'm giving y'all the overview before we get into this. This is a big teaching, and we're only going to touch like a, like a smidgen of this, okay? So let's keep going. Precept on precept, line upon line. Now, when we teach um, Scripture on a Shabbat, that's exactly how we do it. If you really want to understand Scripture... You got to understand that there's two basics that you need to understand. For one, we know um, people call it the Old Testament. I hate to use that term, but I have to do it for, you know, general um, uh, general understanding. The New Testament, on the other hand, is a commentary on the Old Testament. It is not a different gospel. It is not a new religion. Um it is a commentary and y'all know what I mean when I say commentary, right? It is, it is a series of writings of people explaining the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So when they write, when they actually wrote their scriptures, and if you pay close attention, when you study the scriptures, Paul will write something and he'll be like, as it is written in Isaiah. Then he'll write something he'll be like, as it is written in Jer um, Jeremiah or, or um, as it is written in Joel, you know, like, like what Peter would write. So what are they doing is they give you foot, the footnotes, right? These footnotes are for you to go and reference what they're talking about. So when they write as it is in Joel, as it is in um, Jeremiah, as it is in I Isaiah, as it is in um, as Ezekiel, when they saying these things, it's, it's literally a commentary for you to go and research and get the whole concept of what's being said. Because if you don't go and read that whole chapter, or um, a lot of times, sometimes even a chapter before that, you won't get the whole context. And you're not fully understanding what they're saying. Everybody got me? All right, so Isaiah um, 28, 9 through 12 says this. Who shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? So that's what we're talking about right now. Like, how do you understand the scriptures? How do you study the scriptures? What's the best way to understand it? It says, then there are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. And line upon line, here a little and there a little. 
for with the stammering, stammering lips in another tongue while I speak unto this people. All right. And I'm going to move to the next scripture. But so he's telling you that when you understand scripture, you got to take a line here and you got to take a line there. And you got to compare them. And what they do is they build upon each other. They don't count. They don't counteract. They don't rule out. They build upon each other. OK, so let's look at these scriptures. All right, so what is the gospel? We get to about three or four more slides. We wrap this up. All right, Luke 4, um, 17 through 21. And there was delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah. It says Isaiah, but it means Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And he saw us read. So who was the he? Anybody know who's the he? Jesus or Yahushua, right? So Yahushua goes to the temple and he opened up this book. So right now we're talking about what is the gospel? What are we supposed to be following? Because anytime you're talking about the faith, the first thing people say is the gospel. So what exactly is the gospel? So the Mashiach walks into the temple. He walks into the synagogue or the temple, opens up the book, and he starts reading this right here. And we're going we're gonna to go, like I just told you, scripture is what? Line, up, line upon line, precept upon precept. So we're going to go to his precept that he's giving us right now. But we're going to read what he said first, okay? So here we go. The spirit of, I'm, it says the Lord, I'm going to give you the Hebrew names, all right? The spirit or the Ruach of Yahuwah is upon me because he have anointed me to preach, check this out, the gospel to the who? To the poor. Listen closely now. To the poor. He has sent me to heal the what? Broken hearted to preach deliverance to who? Yeah. All right. So the first thing you understand is that whatever this gospel is, it's to the broken hearted, it's to the captives, and um, and then we go on to talk about those who are blind. So you got to find out who are these people that's broken, these people who are um who need deliverance, um who who are in captivity. Y'all catch that? The gospel is, is, is specific of who it's talking about. So let's keep going. And the recovering of sight to the who? Blind. And to set at liberty those that are what? Blind and, blind and bruised, right? So these people that are hurt. So it's a group of people that are hurt and they're captives. And so he said, he said, the Messiah, when he read this book, he says, the, the, um, the Ruach or the Spirit is upon me to preach this news to those people that are in captivity. Did everybody catch that? Okay. So the concept we've learned in, in, in church is that this gospel is to everybody. But you you listen when he says to those that are that are, um that are um need deliverance or that are captive. Everybody's not in, a captive, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> they gotta be a captor and a captive, right? So so we get in the specificity of this gospel already. But let, let's keep going. The preach. The acceptable year of the Lord or the Yahuwah, right? And he closed the book. Now he only read a couple of verses and he closed the book. I'm, we're going to go into the whole chapter, okay? In a second. And then we're going to try to wrap this up. And So we got through the first couple of slides. But he says he closed the book and he gave it to the minister and he sat down. So Christ, he goes in, the Mashiach reads this scripture about preaching this good news or this gospel to these people that are captives. And then he closed the book and he sits down. Right. And he says, and in the eyes of them that were in the synagogue, they were fasting on him. And he began to say unto them. So after he closed it, he said this, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. OK, what? That he's preaching these, this, this good news to those that are captives. Now, if you when you study the whole book of um, uh, Luke and Matthew, you're going to see that there's at that time, there were actually still Hebrews that was in slavery. There was a synagogue um, near Alexandria. It was called the, the Synagogue of the Libertines. Right? Well, not in Alexandria, but my bad. But in um, Jerusalem. It's called the, the Synagogue of the Libertines. It was built by freed slaves in, in Israel. So not only did you have um, Hebrews that was in servitude, Hebrews that was in slavery, Hebrews being oppressed by the, um, by the Romans. Um, if you read another scripture, it talk about how um, at one point in time, the disciples came to Christ and they said, Christ, you know, the Romans took a Hebrew, killed him 
drain his blood and put it in their sacrifices. This is how barbaric the things that was happening to Israel um, were at that time period. People just, I left a long time, I just read, read that and go right over it. The dude was killed and drained of his blood to be mingled in their sacrifices. This is how wicked these people were at the time. So they needed a deliverer. So that's what all this is about. So anyway, so Christ reads this excerpt about the recovering the sight of the blind to free those captives and to heal them that are bruised. He closed the book and he said, this day this is fulfilled in your ears. Now I'm going to ask y'all, why do you think he closed the book? Any ideas? Because the next part of the scripture talks about vengeance for exactly exactly great job man I, like all right so you're already on the path because it, the time wasn't for the next part of the scripture the next part of the scripture is about to happen but all of it is the gospel <laughs> okay so this is the other part of the gospel that nobody wants to talk about they want to talk about because all these things in the greek mind are abstract so, so because the Greeks think abstract, they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, broken hearted, those, I'm broken hearted. I, I, I've had some trouble, you know, I, you know, I had my, my, my grandma died, my, my family uh, lost some money in the business, you know, I've had some hard times. So just talking to me. No, 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 no. This is to a specific people. And when you read the whole gospel, you're going to understand this. Okay. So let me read Isaiah 61, because that's what he was reading. Y'all ready? All right, here we go. The spirit of of um my bad, the spirit of Yahuwah Elohim is upon me because Yahuwah have anointed me to preach the good tidings. That's what he read to the meek. Good um he have sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, exactly what the Mashiach read, and the opening of the prison and them are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he set the book, closed the book, set it down. This is the second part of the gospel. Here we go. And the day of vengeance of our God, of our Elohim. So the next part is the day of vengeance. So now you're talking about a specific people. Do y'all catch that? Vengeance for who? Vengeance for what? Right? And the day of vengeance of our Elohim to do what? To comfort all those that mourn. Let's keep reading. To appoint unto them in where? Zion. What? So it's a specific place now. So it went from a specific type of people that's going through a specific uh, hurt and that's going through a specific captivity. Now they have a specific location. Or like, you know, a group of people. So let's keep going. Point those that mourn in Zion <clears throat> to give them what? Beauty for ashes, right? Okay. So what does that mean? Giving them... <clears throat> um beauty for nothing you got ashes that means that every it's something that's in ashes has been burned it's been destroyed so he's telling you right up the top of the head that whoever these people are they're destroyed all right so here we go the oil of joyful morning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called that they might be called so that's telling you right now that they're not right so not only are they cast down and all these other things but they're well, they're um uh, spoken evil of right it says that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahuwah, that he might be glorified. Now let's keep going. Now it's going to get even more specific about this gospel. And they shall build the old waste. Right? They shall raise up the form of desolations. Now it's talking about them returning somewhere and rebuilding something. Y'all catch that? Okay. So now it's getting even, now it's talking, not only it's talking about the people and where they are, now it's giving like them, it's giving the purpose of this because not only when they, when they get delivered from this captivity, when they get delivered from this oppression, they're going to go do something. They're going to go and rebuild the old ways. Now all this is gospel. This is the gospel. All right. Here we go. And shall raise up the form of desolations. They shall repair the way cities. The desolation of many generations. Here we go. 
and the what? Somebody read me verse five. Aliens shall stand ready and feed your flocks. Okay. And foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. All right. So now he's telling you that whoever these people are, now not only are they going to return back to the some place and rebuild everything, but strangers, other people. So now you see the separation. Okay. Now it's talking about so these other people are gonna stand and, and feed your they're gonna be feed your flocks and your and they're gonna basically do the work in this place that you're going back to rebuild. So now it's getting even more specific. So it's separating. So you got these people and you got the other strangers who are in a different category. So let's keep going. This is my read six for me. You shall be called the priest of the Lord. People will speak of you as the ministers of our God. Of our God, you shall eat the wealth of the nations, and the glory once that of your captors shall be yours. All right. So, uh, in the King James, it reads like, "You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles." So now, going back to more, even more specificity. So it's saying that who these people are, they're not the Gentiles. Did everybody catch that? Okay. It says, you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory, you shall boast yourselves. Now, this that's a deep statement Um, going to some other type teachings. But we're not getting into that today. So we're going to try to wrap this up at nine or you know, about ten after. Here we go. For your shame, ye shall have double. And for your, check this out, confusion. So whoever these people are, not only are they in shame, but they're in confusion. They have, they're confused about something. They don't fully understand. Okay. They shall rejoice in their portion. Before in the in their land, they shall possess the double. They're gonna repay back double for the things that happen to them. Everlasting joy should be unto them. For I, Yahuwah, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth. And I will make a everlasting covenant with everybody. With them, right? Okay. And their seed should be what? Among the Gentiles, right? So if he's telling you that in the gospel that they see going to be known among the Gentiles, what is that telling you? That they're not known, right? So whoever these people are in this gospel is tied to a people who are not known in the, in, in the world. The world don't know who they are. Okay. It says, and their seed should be known among the Gentiles. Right, and their offspring among the people, all that see them shall acknowledge them and say that they are the seed who Yahuwah has blessed. So all this stuff in the night, right now, all this stuff seems strange to us because you know, in our mind says all we ever seen is evil when it comes to us. I mean, that's all we ever get. But um, according to the scripture, there's going to be this future time when the Most High is going to make the other nations first of all un understand who we are. Second of all. They gonna make them acknowledge that not only has he loved us, but that we're we're who um we claim to be. I mean that we're starting to claim that we are. But anyway, as far as coming back to the heritage. So verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in Yahuwah. My soul should be joyful in my Allahim, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath clothed me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh herself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth a bud, and the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth, so Yahuwah Elohim has caused righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Now you see the last verse, there you go. Righteousness and praise to spring forth before the nations. So like I was telling y'all earlier, the purpose of, it, of Israel is to be a light before the nations. 
that the nations might and the, the ones who um, choose to to follow the most high so but we have to set the standard there's no scripture to talk about how we're supposed to uh, establish the earth with what with the law because the scripture says that the law will flow forth from jerusalem once israel is regathered again so um and this this lot i'm just throwing some scriptures out here but this tie back to to paul and paul says that we should prove all things right this is our purpose um in this world our purpose is to be a light so this is why um christ said that um that we're the salt of the earth but check this out now it says he said if a salt has lost its savor what's up with it it's not it's not good then what you do with it right cast it out and then what trample under foot so what happened with the Israelites is when the Israelites lost the laws and statutes when they became wicked because sometimes it was a point when they had the law statutes and they still were wicked because their heart was wicked but when they became wicked they was cast out of their homeland and they was trodden under the foot of men do y'all catch that so they've been tried underfoot ever since because their purpose was they salt their 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 purpose is to be a salt. What does a salt do? It, it it flavors, it preserves, it keeps. Right? So when it if we we if we're not walking according to those scriptures, we have no purpose, because that's what, what our purpose was. So everything in us, that's the reason why we great in everything. <laughs> Just being real. Like, you know, a black person, if you let this is the reason why people don't want us to be involved with stuff, man. We get we get in it, we're gonna basically take it over. Because we have the most high has put all these gifts inside of us. And every gift is to be a light to the world and to use those things that he might be glorified. But facts. when we don't I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said facts. I just said facts, bro. Facts. <laughs> yeah, man. And and when we ain't, we have we're worthless. So it comes to scripture, like like them like um Christ told me, Shiak said. We ain't good for nothing but to be cast out. So, um, hey, keep that one, keep that one call. Yeah, I got kicked out my own call. That's hilarious. Oh. <laughs> Y'all hear me though? Okay. Um, but anyway, I'm, we about to wrap this up, man. Um, this is the first couple of slides, and you know, I'll try to come in on um over time, and we'll start talking about um every aspect of it, because that's the reason why this teaching is so long. Every single aspect of the gospel. We go over who the seed are, who the um who the lost sheep are, who the Gentiles are, um, um, what the true church is, how the assembly supposed to work. Everything is in this teaching, but it's a long teaching because of that. Um, we just we just take it at increments. But so our purpose again, the scriptures tell us that when we lost that purpose, we're good for nothing but to be tried and under. So that's the reason why our people have been tried and under, even though we we so talented and we so gifted, because we we not. Put, we haven't put those things into the proper purpose. But when we're in the proper purpose, ain't nothing nothing that can stop us. Um, which of course is walking in the in the in the light in the unction under the um ruach. Um standing step and step with the most high. So anyway, saying that to say, now um we'll go on next time, we'll talk about um how the gospel works, because the gospel um is is power for salvation to everyone. Right. But the order is to the Yahudim first or to the Israelite first and then it and then the, um, the Gentile. So and, and um, the main reason being because we in the house and the children acting up <laughs> and you got some other kids in that house. 
if your children ain't gonna respect that house, the the um, the people that's visiting that house ain't gonna respect it either. You understand what I'm saying? Um, the people of the people in the family set the tone for what's what's going to be respected and what's not going to be respected. So we have to walk in accordance with our Father, with the Most High, in order for other nations to be able to see the proper way to walk it out. And the first person to ever do that was the Mashiach. The Mashiach came down and walked it out for us, so we can properly understand how to apply these laws, statutes, and commandments. So, anyway, so that's the first part of this. Um, it will be a long teaching. <laughs> I try to shorten it down um, in the future, um, but we'll continue in it. Um, when we get time, we'll, we'll just jump on a conference call. We'll pull up the slides, and we'll walk through it. Any questions? Sounds good. Sounds good, bro.